If a person hurts you, give him love. The worst punishment is to throw someone out of your heart. You should love everyone, for if you cannot love each other, you cannot achieve your goal. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Globetrotting with Gillespie. Yes, it's me, Dana Gillespie, sitting in the marvellous temple of art and music known as the TAM. Actually, a few moments ago, I was almost quite tearful because we were watching in silence too for when Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was being taken into the Abbey. And, you know, it's quite a moving thing. And everyone who knows me knows that I'm a big royal royalist and believe in the monarchy. And I've got to get this off my chest. I think it's appalling that they did a series called The Crown because turning into the royal family into a, into a kind of a soap opera is terrible. And of course, I come from India. I go to India a lot, and they consider it sacrilege to even make a statue of somebody who is still alive. So you definitely wouldn't do a dreadful, smutty thing. If I was given a million pounds to play one of those roles in The Crown, I would have told them to stick it. However, I've got that off my chest now, and I'm going to introduce you in a moment to my wonderful guest, who I first met at the birthday party of my friend David Charkham at the BAFTA. It was me and Dino Baptiste were performing there, and there he was. And then he took me and David Charkham to have tea at the House of Lords. There's a coup there where, where I'm coming from. And any man that can serve me up a crumpet with Marmite on it, yes, 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 it was marvelous. So I would like to introduce you now to Lord Brooke of Alverthorpe, only I call him Clive. Clive, how are you? I'm very well indeed. Sorry I had to get that royalist thing off <laughs> no, my no, chest. No, that's it... perfectly all right. <laughs> I think you're going to wear your glasses. Oh, you've taken them off. I've taken them off, but I'm going to put them uh, on for you. But, well, just so you can see <laughs> me. <laughs> I want to know about your journey, how you came from up north. It was up north, yes. wasn't it? And That's right. Was it trains or something? It's, it's Alverthorpe is a little village just south of Leeds in Yorkshire. Lovely. So what, how did you get to be sitting in the House of Lords? Um, I was born in the last war. Um, my mother and father had three boys and they went 11 years. And in the middle of the war, I was conceived. I was a mistake. <laughs> So I started my life as a mistake. The second thing that went wrong with my life was that having had three boys, they desperately wanted a girl. And I was another boy. So I was off to a bad start there. Disappointment, you mean? Disappointment oh. all the way through. And uh, particularly my father and I didn't have the best of a relationship for much of our life. And uh, that led me an interesting journey. Uh, I was a bright child, I was an attractive child. Uh, my father and I were at a distance, but my mother compensated for it and absolutely smothered me with love. And a uh, wonderful woman, powerful woman. And that's why you like women. Uh, that, oh, very much <laughs> indeed. And I, uh, I took to drink quite early in my teens. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, I was very bright as a, as a youngster, but when I went off to grammar school and got a scholarship, I discovered there were people there with bigger brains than I had. So I had to find a role in life for myself there. And I became the clown in the class. It's always awesome. always acting up and playing up to the front. And of course, drink helped. Yeah. I discovered drink. And uh, I left school at 16, went into the civil service as a clerical officer. And on my first day of joining the civil service, I was asked if I'd become the union representative, the staff representative. So I became an office secretary on my first day. And I found that in fact, the involvement with the union and in part with politics was far more interesting and exciting than the civil service world. Yeah. So I gradually started as a, a volunteer uh, going up within the trade union in the area I was born uh, near Leeds. 21, everything happened that couldn't have been better. I applied for a job with the union on a full-time basis, won it, came to London and became a full-time officer and that was a different life entirely to anything I'd had before. So there I was, 1964, 13th of January, 1964, I started as an employee within the union, and it was everything I wanted. 
not only did I have great uh, interests and opportunities, but I also had a crowd of people around me who liked drinking as well. So drink was your <laughs> sustaining thing, obviously. Right, I mean, way th right way through until 40. Yeah, because you've mentioned it quite a few times already. Has it been a downfall or a positive thing? <laughs> uh, when I look at my... When, I, when I, I sit here today, in the moment, and I watch the Duke of Edinburgh, and I realise that having been born in a council house, yet then having met the Duke of Edinburgh, that with all the things I'd done and drink and the rest of it, I will accept everything I've done, and I wouldn't want to change anything. Because I'm it, a great believer in the now and being with you now. And everything leads to this moment. Exactly. Um, well, seeing as it's kind of Duke of Edinburgh's day, in a way, you've met him and he was an extraordinary guy, wasn't yes. he? Old school, I love these sort of guys. Du duty, duty. Yes, and I think I've, for one, have been imbued with a requirement for service and duty, and I greatly admire. The Queen is quite extraordinary, and yeah. the Duke too. Quite extraordinary people. I think we're very lucky to have such a monarchy in this country. I know there may be other people who think that we're barking mad, but I personally think it it's holds the, the country together in a strange way. Part of our way. uniqueness. Yeah. Distinguishing feature. So, Others don't have it quite the same way as we have. No, look at the presidents around the world. They keep coming and going, but we've got something that keeps going on. So something must have got you to a point where you thought, I don't want to drink anymore. Was, was there... Did you hit a point? Yes, I did. Um, but I'd met the Duke before then. <laughs> what, <laughs> if not... you want to say something about the Duke, I, yes. uh, I went on... you not back a few drinks with him? I went... Uh, I had some drinks with the Duke, yes. Oh, lovely. I went uh, on a... The Duke in 1956 saw there was a problem in the UK, particularly between the unions and management, and the way that uh, they related to the communities. And uh, he felt there was a case for bringing people together, trying to get them to work better with each other. And he thought it should be running not just in the UK, but throughout the whole of the Commonwealth. So he decided in '56 to set up a Duke of Edinburgh study conference on an experimental basis to brought 300 people from all around the Commonwealth, from the 54 countries, to Oxford. And they had an introduction to, to each other in Oxford and they were given a subject to examine, which was the nature of relationships between management and unions and changing technology. What could they do about it? And then they were all broken into groups and sent off to different parts of the UK to explore what was happening in Glasgow, in Cardiff, in London and so on. Then they all came back together at the end of the, uh, the week's uh, exploration, presented reports to him, and he interrogated them on their findings and endeavour to make sure that they were all coming together and working in unison. And it was such a success, this experiment, that they decided that they would run another one in a different Commonwealth country in four years' time. And since then, there have been 44 events in total held on a basis like this. And I was fortunate enough in 1980 to go to one in Canada. Uh, 300 people again from all around the world, from the Commonwealth, coming together and spending uh, a week on the road uh, going to different parts of Canada. Then we all came back into Quebec and presented our reports to the Duke of Edinburgh. And I was drinking then. <laughs> I didn't make as much of the, uh, as the opportunity as I should have done. But I enjoyed it and I learnt a lot. And in fact, I was offered four jobs whilst I was out there. Well, most, people, <laughs> most people like to drink anyway. Yes. So you I like to drink to excess. Once yeah. I started drinking, I drank. I'm like that with chocolate. <laughs> I would say if chocolate made me high, I'd be off my rocker all day long. But, so then that was happening, and then how... You, you go to the House of Lords quite often, don't you? Well, yeah. before COVID, etc. You spend a lot yeah, of well, time... Yeah, I, well, I, I, I was in the trade union movement. I went to the top in the union I was involved with, and then I suppose based to a degree on, on, on uh, what I'd heard from the Duke and from others, I was in the business of collaborating with others and we created a bigger union. And the outturn of that, at 55, I was given the opportunity. I, I come from a smaller union. I couldn't be the top man after we'd had a couple of years in, in, in a partnership. And I was given an option of either retiring early or alternatively being a number two. Well, having been in charge, I didn't want to be a number two. Mm -hmm. So I took early retirement 
went into business on my own as a consultant on, on business works, on how, how do you make your business work better. And very quickly indeed, I was offered by Tony Blair, who was then elected in 1997, an opportunity of going into Parliament, into the House of Lords. That's how I got there. Tony Blair, I'm a Blairite. <laughs> Well, I'm a huge fan of being in the House of Lords. I was so grateful that you took me to tea there. It was so nice of you. Was there one thing, though, that made you suddenly think, I just don't want to drink anymore? I, I, yes, there was. It was uh, December every year was an exceptionally difficult month for somebody who drank a lot. Of <laughs> As in Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Except, yes. The you know. party started at the end of November and ran all the way through the month. And, and one particular, one particular, 1981, I'd been involved in a big pay dispute where we'd done, I'd sailed through the pay dispute fighting Margaret Thatcher with drink <laughs> and soft drugs as well, all over the place. And, uh, and I, I was really quite unwell by the end of the year. Mm. And I went home early one evening, uh, just on the eve of Christmas, expecting my wife to be there, and she wasn't. And, and I was, I mean, I was the one who stayed out, never went home. She wasn't supposed to be out. She came home quite late and she was upset. And I think I detected that she was falling out of love with me. And she was falling in love with somebody else. And I knew I was at the end of the road. I was sick and tired. And I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I knew how to do something if I was to save my marriage. Now, it didn't happen immediately. It took me six months yeah. uh, before I finally decided I got to stop drinking. A psychiatrist I saw in, in Hampstead said to me, she said, what's your problem? Uh, I said, well, I went through it. Five minutes, quiet. You know you're a drunkard. You know you're a drunkard. Do you know you're an alcoholic? I said, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm hanging on to my job. And, you know, I'm, alcoholics are people in their guts, yeah. growling and rolling over and causing trouble. I'm not like that and managing to hang in there. She said, I'll tell you what, if you don't take an important decision very soon, I'll guarantee you'll be down there. You will lose your wife, not just your wife, your job, your health, a lot will go. And I would suspect that within two years, you'll be on the point of dying with the state of your health. So I had to make a very big decision. And uh, with God's grace, uh, something happened. And I uh, decided I had to stop, and I stopped. And my life started changing in the direction of the travel. became quite different. I always feel that if you take one step towards whatever it is, the goodness, ten steps come towards you and lift you to the... But yes. you have, it starts with that first step. One day at a time. Well, yes. <laughs> I've only ever been... One step at a time. I've been only to a... Um, an NAAA meeting in Bombay with our mate David Charkham. And so I'm never really, I don't really know that much about it, but it was quite, an, I could say, rather entertaining to see it going on. But I know, I know that it does so much good for so many people. So how do you spend your days these days? I mean, forget well, COVID. Well, up to COVID. I mean, yeah. my, my, I then went in the House of Lords as a working peer in yeah. 1997. I was scheduled to become a junior whip. Uh, but I was unwell when I went in. I had a cancer and I missed the first few months. And that, again, was a big turning point in my life. Uh, so I missed out on the government job that was going to be on offer to me. Uh, I did have another one offered in 1981, but by then I'd settled down and my wife said that uh, if you take a government job, you'll kill yourself with the way you work. Yeah. I have an addiction to work, like many of us. Lots of other addictions, as well as the drink, as I discovered. Put the drink down, and other things pop up as well. So I, I um, became a backbench uh, peer, and I worked on European legislation. And my day would be uh, going at 2 o'clock. We start with four questions. Ministers have to give uh, replies to us. And then you go into uh, dealing with legislation, or alternatively, you have debates. Or you go into committees, and you deal with topics like European legislation give a view on what's happening in Brussels. And I spent uh, quite a lot of my years working on European legislation. Is there anything, while well, we get closer to the end of the interview, is there anything you'd like to change or be involved in now? I mean, have you got some passions going on? Or are you taking life easy? No. No, I'm not taking life <laughs> I easy. I don't and, think so. And, and <laughs> the, the strange thing is, uh, 
my 70s, I mean, I'm, I'll be 80 next year. Yay. My 70 has been the best decade of my life. Uh, When's I your have, birthday? I've learned on the 21st of June, Midsummer's Day. Oh, lovely. Okay. I've learned that, that uh, uh, if I take life on a daily basis and wait to see what is revealed, I start my day as part of my program with my prayers and my meditation. Mm -hmm, me too. And, and, and I have a commitment to, like the Duke, to discipline. And I've learned that from the discipline has come a freedom that I'd never, never experienced before in my life. And I find that then I'm ready to face the day and see what is revealed to me. And each day something different happens to me when I go in the laws. Today is quite a different day to what I anticipated. <laughs> Well, I can't wait till you're back in the Lords and I can say, can I come have, have some more crumpets with Marmite on, on it? I'd like to do more work in the Lords on the 12-step program. Really? Recovery. Are people res responsive to that, do you think? Uh, people are responsive, but government departments are not. Governments say, where is the evidence? We need hard evidence before we'll introduce that into a policy. And, of course, it's, it's not too easy to get the evidence together, except there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who have recovered from addiction, from drugs, drink, and so on. And now we've got great problems with, with health, with overeating. Mm -hmm. We have a program for overeaters as well. Yet the government will not be prepared to put that in front of people and say, this is an option to you to try and rec get recovery. And we're trying to bring this more to the public's attention. This is what I'm working on at the moment. If anyone can do it, it'll be you. I think, to I'm get the message across. I'm We've been offered an opportunity in uh, September to have a major service in the uh, Westminster Abbey about people returning back to meetings after COVID. Mm -hmm. And we will be endeavouring to bring representatives from all the different 27 12-step type programmes we have in the UK to celebrate this and to celebrate the opportunity of coming back together and trying to go out and spread the message that there is a different way to getting drunk to taking drugs, to overeating, to having too much sex. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's a good one for you to finish up. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I think that's marvellous what you've just said, and I really hope that, um, that it's all going to work out because I, it's such an honour to have you here, Clive. It's, please feel free to come back to the Temple of Art and Music when it's, you know, at the moment it's still, it's sort of up and running as of, I think, in May, whenever the... The lift on date the next is so. Phase of the recovery. So now I always, <laughs> I always finish the interview with a song. So you're going to have to sit back and suffer. Hope you don't mind. But you quite I will like. not suffer. But you like my music. I'm, I'm I a know. great fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, I'm going to finish this little session with a song called Unify because that's what we should do: is unify the world so it can be happier. Mm. Just this body that's born to die. Know the unknowable, you must touch the untouchable and move the unmovable so you can love the unlovable. Only love can unify. Unify. Well, there ain't no difference. Between me and you, black or white, rich or poor, qualified to follow the path. Here's the key to the door, the key to open it if you try. And if you wanna know the unknowable, you must touch the untouchable. To Move the unmovable so you can love the unlovable. Only love can unify. 
This body that's born to die And if you want to know the unknowable You must touch the untouchable the Move the unmovable And think the unthinkable the See the unseeable And hear the unhearable And feel the unfeelable And love the unlovable Only love can unify Unify Only love can unify Only love can unify Isn't that true? Only love can unify That was a song that I wrote with Jake Zeitz, the guitarist from the London Blues Band. I just want to say thank you for tuning in to Globetrotting. And of course, thank you to Lord Brooke of Alva Thorpe. Though I think Clive is a kind of easier mouthful. <laughs> Till next time. Thank you, Clive. Thank you very much. Tune in to Globetrotting. There is nothing that love cannot achieve in this world. It can even melt the hardest of rocks. When the principle of love in every human being is unified, it becomes cosmic love.